Did you know each year the U.S. and Canadian governments provide billions in R&D tax credits to fund businesses? Oh, yeah. Our guest is the co-founder of a fintech platform that fuels innovation through automating access to R&D tax credits. So don't leave money on the table, founders. Stay tuned for the Start of Life live show. Let's glow. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Startup Life Live Show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons, four times founder and startup champion to founders around the world. And after raising four businesses of my own, I now share founder startup stories to help newly minted business owners find the solutions and inspiration they need to succeed. So I say thank you for carving up time to tune in and up your founder game while cheering on a fellow founder. You never know, a new resource, tool, solution, or a good old fashioned aha moment will come to you while hearing and participating in this startup journey that will help you and your startup. And if you're joining us live today, please share a howdy do in the comment threads. And if you're joining us via replay, remember your comments and questions are just as important. So pop them into the comment threads. And how do you know when, um, how can you receive an alert whenever I post a new show? Well, you need to join the meetup group, the Startup Life Live meetup group right here. Scan that QR code or go to bit.ly backslash startup life live in all caps. So you'll get a receipt, uh, an alert whenever we go live. If you resonate with the show's mission of amplifying diverse voices while serving first time founders around the world, please consider supporting the startup life live show with a small donation. All the details are on my website, Andy at andylyons.com. And oh boy, thank you for sharing your like love wherever you're watching this video. We are live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, slash Periscope, Twitch, and Facebook. And when you like this video, it goes out into your stream. And there could be someone in your stream that would really benefit from the information we're talking about today. So thank you. And if you're tuning in from YouTube and you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the bell icon so you're alerted whenever I post a new video. All right, let's get down into the details today because I am so excited to introduce you to my guest, Lloyd Lobo. He's a serial entrepreneur with deep experience in machine learning and AI, and he's currently co-founder of Boast AI. Let me just bring up a little woo, graphic here so you can see while I read about it. So this is the fintech platform I was telling you about that's fueling innovation through automating access to R&D tax credits. And Boast AI has helped thousands of companies streamline the R&D tax credit application process so they can move more money faster and for less risk. And I gotta tell you, this can be a really arduous experience here. So you need to go over to their website, hop on and see if you qualify for this opportunity to get tax credits. Because right now, Armed with $123 million in funding, Boast AI is on a mission to enable innovators to change the world through non-dilutive capital. And how much do we love non-dilutive capital? And how much do we love this mission? Oh, my gosh. Let me not waste another second. Let's bring Lloyd Lobo into the room and say, yay! That was a fantastic intro. Love it. You're a pro. You should be emceeing the Super Bowl. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will take that. How are you today, Lloyd? I'm so grateful you could join me on the show. I'm doing fantastic. You got your health and you got your life and you got your family and the weather is great and we can start going out again. I'm in San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, great. Thank it's all great. No. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, San Francisco Bay Area. One of my favorites. Places to go is the water bar right there by the, the Bay Bridge. So I can watch the lights on the Bay Bridge and enjoy my time there. Um, you know, you wrapped up one of my great questions, which is what are you grateful for today? And you just said it all. You're healthy. <laughs> you can get out. <laughs> the family's doing well. Yes. 
Yeah, my parents just flew in. My parents live in Toronto, Canada. Excellent. They just flew in yesterday to spend time with us. Uh, we have a third kid on the way. I got a seven-year-old. I got a three-year-old. Um, you got your health. You got your yeah. family. And you can go out again. Nothing and, else matters. And you have your youth. Yeah. <laughs> because a dad of three, oh, my gosh. You know, when you have two, it's one-on-one, -on -one, right? If you want to use basketball terms. But, boy, when you get a third one in, it becomes zone defense. Yeah. And what they what they say often is um, when you're a startup founder, there's so much going on that you can pick maybe two out of five things. And, and that is your health meaning working out, yeah. your family, your work, um, social life experiences. <laughs> I think I think you got my business, my health, and my family is good enough for now. Absolutely. And those are the things that we can wake up and say, okay, life is good. I can solve the problems as they come in when I've got all of this going for me already. Hey, folks, you know, I love amplifying your brand. You startup founders out there who have the courage to get up every day and pursue your passion and your why. So please share your website, your one-liner, your URL, business name, the works, bring them up. And I, and I know Lloyd will join me. We'll celebrate you live because you never know who's tuning in, who can see your business and go, oh, I want to go follow them, learn more about what they're doing. It happens on the Startup Life Live show. I'm going to tell you that right now, folks. And speaking of Canada, hey, Brent, thank you for tuning in. Happy Monday. Well, it's actually Tuesday. You must have had yesterday off because that can happen sometimes. So happy that you're tuning in from Canada. And Joan, my gosh, how are you? So happy to see you. You know your stuff and remain two steps ahead always. Thank you so much, Johnny, for that wonderful, wonderful comment. We're so excited to talk to Lloyd today because... This is something that isn't talked about enough, which is other ways of funding your business and finding out non-dilutive ways where you can maintain the equity and build the value of your business early on is so important because then when you want to bring in funding, you're going to, you're not going to give as much up when in equity. So I first though must find out Lloyd, what happened that you decided I am going to become an entrepreneur? I'm going to give up payroll and benefits <laughs> <laughs> and just say, see you, bye. I'm feeling called to become an entrepreneur. Did you have examples growing up with entrepreneurship? Not really. So I come from a very risk averse family. My parents are from India. I, uh, they were working in Kuwait in the Middle East because back in the day, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, people would go to the Middle East, not come to the West. And so I was born in Kuwait and um, I grew up there and, and the whole lifestyle there was about just, you know, go to school, get a job, get married, have kids, don't rock the boat. Uh, if somebody calls out your name in aggression, just keep walking. Uh, that's the life uh, I lived. And um, I had the experience or, or I guess misfortune slash good fortune of being a refugee of the Gulf War. In the early 90s, there was a war in Kuwait, and I had to hop on a bus from uh, Kuwait through Baghdad to Jordan. And I experienced like extreme uncertainty. And, you know, one of the most interesting learnings there during that time was we weren't sure if we were going to live or die. But everyone on that bus going from Kuwait to Baghdad to Jordan and trying to get out of that uh, situation, I lived in a, in a refugee camp for a long time. And... We didn't know if we were going to live or die, but everyone on that rickety bus was singing along the way. And that formulated my thesis in life that it's neither the destination nor the journey, but the companions that matter the most. And so what ended up happening was... Oh, wait, wait. Say that one more time. It's neither the journey nor the destination, but the companions that matter the most, right? Who cares... So who, We're stitching who, that on a pillow. <laughs> that's amazing. So who cares if you're on a crappy journey on the way to hell? With great companions, it becomes a memorable experience because ultimately life is not about just having a good time, right? Anything worth doing is not easy and, and pain is a precondition for growth. And so then if, if life is meant to be pains and learning experience and route to extreme growth, 
then the companions matter the most, right? Like I, I remember not having any money growing up or like hanging out with uh, with kids. My parents raised a family on like $50,000 Canadian. My mom never worked uh, and even less uh, growing up and, you know, gave us the perfectly uh, awesome life. I couldn't have asked for more. I never thought I missed anything. My parents sacrificed a lot. And what I, what I felt through that is ultimately the companions that matter. And that's, that's what my parents taught me is like, you become successful by enabling the success of others. Uh, it's the companions that matter. Um, and, 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 and so what ended up happening was finally, we ended up in Canada. I did engineering in Canada. 2006, I moved to the US, worked at a number of startups that I call mm -hmm. failed experiences. I worked at these startups, but here's what I call a failure. If the founders or the key execs don't make money, even if the startup was acquired, it's considered a failure. But failure isn't necessarily bad because you learn what not to do the next time. You it come there comes a lot of learning experience that you can implement in your next companies. Right. So anyway, I I was in the U.S. I was working for this uh, startup in Philadelphia. And uh, I'd work till eight, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, sit in the office. I was running sales and marketing. One day I started going home at six and I get this email from the CEO of the company saying, hey, I used to like it when you're in the office till eight, nine. You're going home at six this week. Your wife is a resident. My wife was a, uh, doing her residency at Drexel mm -hmm. in Philly. Your wife is a resident. So she's working hundreds of hours anyway. What do you need to go home for? My parents were in town that week and I'm like, dude, right? My parents are in town. And that, that day, my best friend called me, Alex, my co-founder at Boast AI, Alex Popa. Um, him and I studied engineering together. We were partners in every project. His daughter is my godchild. My daughter is his godchild. We've been, we worked on a number of projects together. But uh, he called me and he said, hey, I'm at KPMG. Um, each year, hundreds of billions are given in tax credits to fund businesses, but the application process is manual and cumbersome. It's prone to frustrating audits, and it takes a long time to get the money. Let's uh, let's change this industry. I, I literally cried to him when he called, and I said, this is what happened right now. I don't care what we build, but if we can build a company that we want to work for, I'm in. I don't believe in this startup hustle porn, right, which is... Everyone has to work 80, 90 hours a week. People burn out. If people can live good, balanced lives personally, then they'll perform at the highest order professionally. Life and business is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And so it's very important that people can move in a sustainable fashion. Right. right? And, and, and so his, his call to me, I literally cried. And I'm like, Let, let's build a company that we want to work for. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I've been... A I just have to say what's what's wonderful about your story and your origin origin story is you chose to be on that bus with folks who the outcome was so uncertain okay as far as life and death and you lived with that with song in your heart you were with companions that understood that they were going to focus on the good in the moment and bring out the good in each other in the moment which is a lesson you have carried through with you and has also uniquely prepared you to be a founder. Then you tried a few startups and I'm like you, you know, four times founder, you know, if you can build the business, make sales, repeatable sales, et cetera, that to me is a, a success. Maybe you don't exit, maybe you don't make all the money you want. Maybe the, you know, there's a fire that burns everything down and that's the end of that startup, whatever it is. It, prepares you for the next one and the next one. You never lose everybody in the startup world. I'm just going to say hello to a few folks. Hey, Asia, so happy that you're here tuning in with us today. I know. Isn't Lloyd amazing? Absolutely. And Heather is like, stitch it all. Everything that Lloyd's been saying, stitch it all. She really loves you become successful by enabling the success of others. She loves that too. And Professor Dax Joni here saying, thank you for those great insights. And, um, and Asia goes on to say, if we can build a company that I want to work in, then I'm in. Yeah, we'll put that on the pillow too. I'm going to have a lot of stitch that on a pillow. <laughs> Absolutely. 
And Asia's right too, by taking the risk, there's a chance of reward. Yes. So remember folks, if you've got any questions for Lloyd as we're going along, pop them into the common threads. You know, this is the time when you can pick this amazing brain that you've seen start to talk and share from an incredible lived experience. So Lloyd, tell me, what was it? Because weren't your first few startups also machine learning and AI? Yeah, so I, I did automatically. When Alex and I got together, we did a number of products together. We yeah. we built an incubator that didn't work out. We built a conference that didn't work out. Um, we built a product called Automatically. It was a chatbot built on top of Zendesk. The theme there was customer service agents are inundated and customers are frustrated. If you could respond like a real human intelligently, automatically, then you would have the opportunity to light customers. A lot of the times the weight is more frustrating than, than the pain that you're dealing with, right? So you're frustrated by something, you call or you email, you message and you get bounced around and time kills all relationships, right? And so we're like, can we take that query and respond like a real human? So we built that. Um, ultimately that failed, but a lot of good learnings there. And one of the key learnings there was Focus. The most important thing you can do as a founder is focus. Focus will elevate your messaging and help you build stronger connections. It's better to go an inch wide and a mile deep than a mile wide and an inch deep. So, for example, um, with uh, with automatically, what had happened was we said large enterprises are not getting responses, responding to customers. Customers are frustrated like a jet blue. We could go online and see there were all these responses that were unattended. So we did all our customer development and research on large enterprises. We would talk to them and they would say, yeah, our, our agents are inundated. And then what happens when you don't respond on time? Ultimately, people are pissed off and they go start tagging our CTO or C our CEO online. Mm -hmm. And we said, what if in, in the magic in the perfect world, if you had a magic wand, how would you see this working? They're like, in the perfect world, and this is before the existence of bots. This was 2012, 13, 14, right? Um, in the perfect world, if we could respond like a real human to inbound queries, that would be amazing. So we built this chat bot. What we realized when we built it was we did all this customer development on large companies, but when we went to deploy it, um, those large companies were using tools like Oracle and Salesforce that a huge review process before you integrate with their tools uh, to respond. And so we scrambled and we pivoted and we then reached out to Zendesk who at the time, it was very easy to get in their marketplace. You could just build an app and deploy there. They were just building out their platform and they had a lot of customers. I think there's something like 20,000 customers or so back then or, or 10. And we talked to the people at Zendesk. They let us deploy in weeks. We deployed there. When we deployed it, everyone would respond saying, make this thing stop. And we asked them what happened, right? And we realized that with large customers, large enterprises, they have lots and lots of historical data. But Zendesk, their average customer is an SMB, maybe 20, 30 people mm -hmm. back in the day, uh, 10 years ago. And... Um, they didn't have a lot of historical data. So when you don't have historical data and you try to apply machine learning models and, and whatnot, uh, you respond with gibberish, right? And so then we made the product editor approved like a chatbot is today. And then even then they were like, we don't have so much historical data. So um, it's it's effectively make, we have to write rewrite the whole response. Now, if I knew then what I know now, the one thing was clear out of that exercise customers want an outcome. They don't want your fancy dashboards. They don't want software. They don't want AI. They want an outcome. Your job is to get them that outcome in the early days as much as possible. And if that means putting humans or doing things that don't scale, that's perfectly fine as long as you have a path to automation eventually uh, that you can scale. Automation helps you scale, but doing things that don't scale helps you validate the market. Otherwise, you'll go and build a whole bunch of stuff that nobody wants. So it's like, right. do things that don't scale and get enough feedback and get them in the data. So we went with the automation first route. And if I knew then what I know now, we would have just gone and asked people, what are your like 20 most common questions? And we would have created a bot for them based on that. Um, and that would have been a better experience. And then we would have iterated from there. I love that. I'm having a... 
I'm having this Andy-licious moment, folks, because first of all, take it in. Focus is so key. Go deep in this one area instead of a mile wide, right? And that's easier said than done. I know you're putting out a lot of fires. You're managing a lot. You've got team acquisition. You've got customer acquisition. You've got investors. There's so much going on. But stay focused in your lane, even if you have to put up blinders or someone to remind you of that. And then also, as you're building, what is the outcome customers want? Yes, of course, the navigation is lovely, et cetera. But if you're satisfying them and giving them that outcome, that is an antilicious moment for your customers and for you and the business. And then finally, you know, do that beta test, right? Lloyd, get that information from folks. And I would say, you know, I wouldn't even call it beta test. I would say always be talking to customers and always get be getting data on how they use the product and improve. So for example, in the early days, you got to spend as much time as possible onboarding them, watching them, see how they use things and just ensuring that they're getting the time to value, right? They're getting the time to value. So for example, um, I, I have a friend who runs this company called Lumen5. In the early days, how it's, it's a video editing product. It's like right. can, Canva for video. And in the early days, what he would do is he would post gigs on Fiverr. I, you guys have probably heard of Fiverr. Um, and, um, and he would post video creation gigs on Fiverr. Through that, he got his first 100 customers. And then he would create videos for them manually, and customers would be delighted with the video. Then he, he used that as a market validation that people want this. And then he started building an automation an automated video creator. And that product has evolved since, but consistently, right? That shipping product to customers, making sure they get an outcome. Ultimately, if customers don't get an outcome, they're gonna churn and the best way, and you need to control churn, right? So you go through phases as a company. Your phase one, when you just have an idea, is to validate the market. What does validation mean? Validation means you got maybe 30 to 50 people that are really interested. Maybe they have agreed to a paid pilot with you or or they've signed up for a beta. Um, there's interest, there's validation. And everything starts with the TAM, assuming that you have a large total addressable market and uh, there is um, validation that a small subset of people are interested. It's very important to please a small subset of people because if 10, 20, 30 will buy and they're happy and they stay, then you can scale that to hundreds. So that the first phase is validation. The second phase is product market fit. And the way we define product market fit is one kind of customer, right? Uh, that comes to your product to get specific job done. You have an ideal customer, one kind of customer that comes to your product or service to get something done. Um, and coupled with that is retention. You have high retention, meaning every time th they need um, that uh, to fill that or get that job done, they come back to your service. So they want an outcome, one kind of customer, one kind of outcome. Every time they want that outcome, they keep coming back to your product. And that's what, that's what I call product market fit. Generally, uh, if you're in the B2B space, product market fit is somewhere between half a million and a million in revenue. But most important in that phase is it's one kind of customer, Right. Coming to get one job done and they don't leave. You have high, high, high retention. They're sticking around. So your key metric there is retention right. and you're doing things that, uh, that and you've don't got, scale. And you've got what Warren Buffett calls a good moat, meaning you've got something that really differentiates you from the competition. So that as you grow, you've got something that's going to, as Lloyd said, is going to retain them. And, you know, everybody knows, you know, I live for the value prop. I mean, that's just the number one reason, uh, startups fail is that they build something folks don't want. So I love that you gave us some really great advice on the value prop. Let's bring Boost AI in because now you join your co-founder because you're going to work someplace. <laughs> you're going to build a business that you want to work at. How have you proven the value prop at Boost AI? How did you find that customer fit? How did you find the folks that said, yes, we want you over somebody else? How was that process for you? Definitely. So um, what we found is that the industry was mired by consulting firms doing this manually, like big four accounting firms. Yeah. And, and you know, big four does a lot of things manually, right? People go to become CPAs and then earn CPE credits and they're maximizing billable hours versus value. And we said, when you, 
there's billions of dollars given in government incentives to fund businesses, but it needs to be filed with your taxes. And when anything needs to be filed with your taxes, you know, dealing with your personal account and you give them a shoebox after the end of the year, the same way these large accounting firms will come in at the end of the tax year and try to do a proctology exam asking you, tell me what all the R&D and product development projects you did that meets this narrow criteria. Who has the time to even think through? Who knows the criteria? Then if that gets audited, the government's going to run a proctology exam. And, <laughs> and, and, and you got to prove like what projects you worked on, what was the documentation, because it's government money. So they right. don't want people claiming frivolously, right? You don't want like butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, not, not saying that they don't do R&D, but you don't want people who don't innovate the, to claim free government money. This sure. money is to increase jobs and innovation. Every dollar spent in innovation returns 20 in new economic activity. And so it's important to help innovators. That's why the government has this money. And so hence the lot of red tape around figuring out if So was it because uh, it your co-founder worked at KPMG that he knew that this was a problem that needed solving? Yeah, he, he knew this was a problem. And so we started reaching out to people and everyone's like, if you can do it better, faster, cheaper, that's great. So we started with just streamlining the process. Now we started it with a very manual process. We knew that the big four is coming in at the end of the year. So we started collecting the data and having more frequent conversations. Then from that, we automated the data collection and the workflow and the tax rules. Now we're getting into machine learning products, which automatically writes reports and then we're getting into a new product, which we got a hundred million credit facility for, which is part of that 123 you talked about at the beginning. And that would just tell people that you get, you sit on these R&D credits for the whole tax year, but you can't file for it until your tax filing season. And then you can't get it until it's processed. So that whole process from the first dollar you spend in product development is 16 months. Why wait for this oh government gosh. tax filing season and government processing times, use Boast, plug your tech and financial stack to Boast and get your money now as you do it. So that's another product that we'll be launching in Q4 and mass. We're testing it in beta with a bunch of customers. We've got a lot of interest because we got covered on it for Forbes, but that's the thing, right? Ultimately hundreds of billions given in R&D credits to fund businesses, manual cumbersome process, prone to frustrating audits. Yep. It takes a long time to get the money. We want to help companies get more money faster for less time and risk. Ultimately, the big vision is helping innovators change the world and become successful. And, and to do that, we have a sort of mantra or very um, fundamental truth we believe in. Fall in love with your customer and make them successful beyond your product or service. Fall in love with your customer and make them successful beyond your product or service. If you build a community, you won't become a commodity. And that's something we fundamentally wow. believe in. So when we started the company, we used to do these pizza nights. And, uh, and because we knew that founders need more than just government incentives and money, right? Resources is number one. How do you build a company? How do you scale it? How do you do PR? How do you hire? How do you validate the market? So we used to do these pizza nights. And every time we do them, more and more people would show up. Those pizza nights turned into uh, regular events. It turned into a conference. And today it's a community of 110,000 subscribers called Traction. Bravo. And we um, donate all the profits from it. We host nearly 100 events a year, including webinars, weekly, two webinars a week. We'll get oh, I know. It comes into that. my email. And I got to yeah. tell you, it's so exciting. The conversations. You've got one today on free PR. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm not a great host as you, so but but, but I do my best, and I got to get you to host one of the sessions in the coming hey, weeks. Hey, I'm here for you, baby. Absolutely, in a heartbeat. So what's great is you know Asia is a UX UI expert. Okay, she's building her business, and she's asking some good questions here. Um, I know Asia that you asked about like a unit test. So this must have been earlier on for a functional component. Um, you know, I understand, and then. Asia also says outcome, provide something that might not work perfectly, but can scale and gets feedback. Is this the same as your MVP? Yes. So that's that's effectively right, right? Your MVP. So a lot of people, um, they get hung up on the definition of an MVP. MVP, your, your job, like I talked about the phases of a founder. Job number one is to validate the market. Job number two is to get to product market fit. Job number three is get to product channel fit. Product channel fit is in, in phase two, you've validated the you, you've you've got high retention and you've got to have a million a million by any means possible. You've got paying customers. 
Phase three is figuring out one channel that if you spend a million dollars, it turns into three, four, five million. You, you have a repeatable, scalable model. And by phase three, you've, you can say I, one kind of customer coming through one kind of channel, getting one kind of value. We got to 10 million in revenue with Those just one channel, right? Okay, like one channel. The, the community driven model serving one kind of customer, which yeah. is technology founders, innovators and one kind of product, R&D credits. Now we're doing our second act, which is the financing of those credits and then other innovation insights that'll help companies right. innovate faster. But then the phase four is scale where you try multiple product lines and you try multiple channels. So you're spending two thirds of your time growing into your existing TAM and, and scaling what's working. And maybe you spend one third of your time testing out new things to figure out, hey, does another scalable channel or product line squeeze out of it? Um, yeah. and, and, and so Asia says, breaking things down into small enough pieces to see what brings the most money. Exactly, right? And so in that early days, the MVP, the MVP can be anything. So in, in the example I gave of Lumen5, his MVP was he went and posted on Fiverr, hey, anyone needs video creation? He got a lot of interest. His MVP was customers got a video. In our case, the MVP was we went and talked to customers. They wanted the R&D credits off their plate, more money, faster, less time and risk. They got a check from the government and we gave them all the reports and we did the filing for them. They didn't know if we were using software or we had human bodies there. Ultimately, your MVP one can be a Wizard of Oz, right? Like right. it looks like there's something, but there's there's mechanical trick going on. And I like that model because the thing is, if you do something manually, you know what are the pain points and right. then you can automate those things. But if you start with automation, then you can go in any number of rabbit holes. But if you do something very manually, and, and this is- this That's is great a, advice, by the way. Yeah, it's, it's a key step to building an AI company because think about it this way. You go through the whole workflow yourself, then you figure out what are the common uh, points of frustration in doing this workflow manually. Then you automate each of the things that you can automate and then you've collected, started to collect data. Now you have enough data and workflow automation. And then in a couple of years, you can start applying machine learning where it gets yeah. smarter and more and more automated. And that's how it needs to work because I've tried it the other way and failed twice before, right? Automatically, speakeasy, and so on. Right. And what I also love about what you said, Lloyd, is the fact that, um, and I think it just went right out of my head. Oh, the founders, take this in. You heard how he, had his number one MVP, most minimum viable product, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you excel at that. You really get that buffed mm -hmm. up, polished, looking good. Then you go ahead and you start your next one, but it's not some arbitrary thing way over here that's not connected to your original. You are going to piggyback off of what you've learned with your MVP, your first one, right, Lloyd? Yes, exactly. Everything you, the, the only thing constant in cha is change. And pain is the precondition for growth. So you got to learn and keep growing. You look at these bodybuilders, they're jacked. Why? Because they keep lift. They, call, they do this concept right. called progressive overload. They're ripped. Why? Because they keep progressing. But if you look at like your maintenance worker, they're not. They usually, they look big, but they've got a big belly hanging out. And that is, that is the interesting thing. When you keep doing the same thing over and over, your body adapts. And startups and brain power Humans are like that. Businesses are like that. You got to keep adding more stress. You overcome that stress and you grow and you grow yeah. and you grow. It's and and that's, that's, and that's, that's what I find is a, is a key nugget here. Take the learnings, move on, move on, keep improving. Everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face. The important thing is to you shift that one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it, it is to ship fast, ship often, and iterate along the way. Release well, here, fast, release often, iterate founder, along the way. Here's a founder, Lloyd, who is doing this phenomenally, Lisa Caprelli. She's doing it with children's books, and she also has an Amazon TV show where children send in their content, okay? And this, she's just started when the pandemic hit, and she shifted, and she's building, and it's amazing. Thank you for saying another great show female founder, Lisa Caprelli. So happy to see you. And Richard O, I know that you're taking in a lot of the great nuggets and gems that Lloyd's <laughs> giving out today. Yay. And Asia, you've been asking some great, great um, questions today. The bigger you get, the more pieces to break. How does that work for taxes? 
<laughs> yeah, so it, it worked for taxes because honestly, at the end of the day, the data collection and the parsing of that data is a huge pain after the end of the year. And this is research and development tax credits. It's not just your taxes where you par par pass a shoebox, right? It's right. like you got to go through all the product development activity you did. You got to identify what work you did that meets this narrow criteria for the government funding. Then you got to prove who all spent how much time on it. You got to back up time tracking. You got to marry it to payroll. Then you got to write long reports, project reports. Then you got to file it. And then if the government audits you, you got to explain all of that reasoning on why why you right. claimed all that money. And so we automate that process. It's a it's a big big yeah. Big that's what pain. Anish is saying. Eliminating the pain point, and you get the jewel because yeah. the customers are happy and they're getting what they want. And hey, Ning, how you doing? Yes, right. This is great info. And be sure to you know, amplify your business, share what you're working on uh, in the comment thread so we can bring it up and cheer you on. And I'm right with you, Joni, right here. Mind is blown with all of this great information. And uh, but you know, you when you when did you guys launch Boast AI? So it's interesting. We incorporated Boast AI in 2017. Prior mm -hmm. to that, we did a few other products. We had Boast Capital running like a consulting firm, um, which was doing the work manually, trying to understand the pain points. Um, we, uh, I did a product called Speakeasy, which was funded by Salesforce and Bessemer. And um, that was AI for sales that failed. We did automatically. We did a number of things. And through all those failures, we settled and said, hey, let's just work on one product, one kind of customer, one kind of channel, one kind of value. There's a big market here. So we, yeah, we, we incorporated the company in 2017. Excellent. Meanwhile, your, your wife completed her residency. Yeah, my wife, my, my wife and Alex's wife ensured there was food on the table so we could go on this entrepreneurial journey. I love that. We, we have that rule at the lion's den. Someone must be on payroll. <laughs> yeah, someone must be on payroll. It's hard, right? right? And so I say, you know, a lot of people talk about privilege. I think I have great founder privilege. We come from uh, families that have been very supportive. Without them, this wouldn't be possible at all. Right. Um, Asia's asking another great question. I didn't, I don't understand this. I heard there was like $2 billion of artist lost income due to metadata. What does that mean? That I, I have no idea. I have no talking. idea, Asia, what you're it, talking it doesn't, about. It doesn't, doesn't relate to my mm -hmm. business, but yeah. I should look into it maybe down the road. But, you know, when you did get funding, because it says, you know, now that you're armed with $123 million, how you know how did you get through those lean days? Were you bootstrapping? Yeah, you know, relying on the your beloved. We relied on we relied on customer revenue that was fueled Excellent. by the big community we built. Excellent. Um, and uh, and and we did that for a long time. We bootstrapped the company. We had zero outside funding. Perfect. We got a government grant in 2019, I believe. Um, and then small, small government grant, about four or 500,000, something like that, which is significant actually now, which is significant when you look back, but now compared to what you've raised, doesn't seem as significant. So we, we got, uh, basically we bootstrapped the company with customer money. Then we got a government grant and then we raised a series A funding round and then we did a debt facility. So I think the most important thing is understanding how to capitalize your company. <clears throat> a lot of founders, what they do is they try to raise VC money on the, from the get-go. And the issue with doing that, um, my ch charger is going to lose charge here. But the issue with, do with doing that is if you keep chasing VC dollars and valuations, you can only be true to one thing. And that is the transaction. Life and business is a marathon. It's not a sprint. If you treat people like a transaction on the way in, they'll treat you like a transaction on the way out. So when you optimize for valuations and go on this VC hamster wheel, your decision making eventually ends up chasing metrics and numbers. Um, and I think in the early days, it's really important to build your muscle of being frugal. How do you um, bootstrap the company? How do you do more with less? And once you've figured out how to get, keep, and grow customers in a scalable, repeatable, frugal way, then you should raise money. I fund, um, There are some business ideas that you need to raise money from the get-go, like building a vaccine, a lot of things. Yeah, life like, sciences usually, yeah. Yeah, but if you're building the nth app, like 
string it together if you can. Find a coder, validate the market. I, I just talked about how you, two ways, examples I gave, where you can do a sort of concierge plus right. Wizard of Oz MVP and you can you can validate the market, right? So Lumen5, they put these videos on Fiverr. They said, basically, if you want video done, we'll, we'll create it for you. Lots of people expressed interest and then they learned. We said, we'll do your R&D credit filings. We'll get you more money faster for less time and, and risk. And we got lots of customers. We did it manually and then we built a product from it. So ultimately, there's a lot of ways to validate yeah. the market and you can get customer money. Anything of value, anything worth doing, right? People will uh, will pay for if right. you're taking a pain point, especially in the B2B space. So you can do this Wizard of Oz and you can validate the market and get paid for it. And I just want to congratulate you and thank you for... We're clapping for the founder journey advice, folks. Really, Lloyd, this is going to help people for years to come. Oh, you're, that, you're being, you're being, you're no, being no, too kind. No, no, that's specific advice, folks. You know, whatever it takes, pr prove your ability to run a lean machine. Here's why. You are going to love keeping the value of your business in your business. When you start, you know, going for that pre-seed money and then the seed money, by the time you get to a series A, what's left for you? At the end of the day, when you do have an exit, an acquisition, you go public, it's really not as much in the bank for you. And you're putting out all this effort. You're bringing your creativity, your innovation for your business. Get the customers Find the non-dilutive equity that you can put into the business. Find other ways to fund it. And you will have a much more valuable business. Plus, you'll have the traction you need that make investors very happy when they go to put their money in. And there's more negotiation on your part as to what you can get. Right, Floyd? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And then a Asia asks about... Uh, concierge, Wizard of Oz, what I'm seeing with concierge MVP is like, you don't have to have a built out product, right? With the Wizard of Oz, what that really means is customer wants an outcome, you deliver an outcome, doing it manually. Right. The concierge is maybe you have somewhat of a product, but you're not, you know, it's not ready for prime time where you think a customer can use it and get an outcome from it. So you concierge style onboard them and you leverage that product to get them the outcome. So there's many ways to get the customer the outcome, but the job of an MVP is a customer should ex experience the time to value. That's right. And, and also and <clears throat> when you're delivering this experience and this wonderful outcome to them, you're delivering it in a way that's meaningful for them that creates the brand promise experience for them. So they're going to stay with you because you are meeting the brand promise. How was it for you and the co-founder to bring on talent? I mean, because as you built this, you had to bring on teams. You had to bring on folks who may not get market rate to join your team. How did that go for you? You know, one of the, one of the key things, the job of a leader is to build, inspire, and motivate a team to deliver. Right? Um, and, and a big part of building, inspiring, and motivating a team is, is communication, right? Speaking your vision, clearly articulating and communicate your vision to excite, inspire, and motivate people is one of the most important skills to have as a leader. And it's not a one and done activity. It's the leader's job to do this day in, day out because excited, inspired, and motivated people can move mountains. So as a leader, your job is to keep communicating the vision, um, not, the, not the activities that are sort of immediate. Yes, the, there are immediate skills. I have this philosophy and I'm going to potentially write a book on this. It's called Camper, C-A-M-P-E-R. I wish every company was designed like playing a game or writing a Peloton. When you join, you have you feel connected because there's a sense of community around, right? right. You, see, you see everyone playing along with you. You have autonomy, meaning people are not micromanaging you. You know the vision, the mission, the values, the goals but your leaders are not micromanagers. They are inputs, not approvers. So you have the connection, you have the autonomy, you have mastery, you have, you have the ability to master something where you keep leveling up and being better and better at your craft. 
Um, you have a sense of purpose. Purpose is really, really, really important. People who have unquenchable thirst for us for that purpose can move mountains and change the course of history. You're energized because everyone around you is going along that mission and that purpose. And you're recognized along the way. Like, why do you have to ask for a raise? You should be recognized and rewarded along the way. So I, I, I feel that, you know, connection, autonomy, mastery, purpose, energy, and recognition are keys to attracting people. Camper, we love a good acronym. Happy Perfect. campers. If you, if, you, if you can institute camper in your company, you'll have happy campers. I love it. I love that something fierce. This is wonderful. Well, you know, in, in building that business, and it's not just, you know, keeping the customers happy. It's also the team happy. And you talked about that, you know, as they, we had Jennifer uh, Foxworthy on a few weeks ago, and that's what we talked about, that you can get so bogged down in the details, founders, that you forget that you are here to lead and inspire. That is your role as the founder. And so it's important that you keep coming up out of the weeds to remember what your role is, whether it's for your team, for your investors, for the customers, et cetera. But uh, Richard, oh, he's liking that a lot. Happy campers. Yay. And Asia K is saying uh, time plus value added equals heart for users and customers. And so many of us, as we build our business, we're trying to find that sweet spot. And you have brought so much great information for us today, Lloyd. This is so remarkable. There are going to be so many sound bites and uh, delicious digestible nuggets that I'll be pulling out of this conversation. What hard thing are you working on right now with Boast AI that, you know, founders can do hard things, folks, that perhaps someone watching the show could add, open a door, add wind to your sale? What's going on with Boast AI? And you can also talk about tractionconf.io as well. Uh, I mean, you know, tractions are a community. Everything is in the in the grand scheme of things. Right now, we're trying to rapidly scale the company to across cities. In what does that your, rapidly scale look like? La rapidly scale meaning grow from over ten million in revenue to forty million in revenue in the yes. next in the next uh, eighteen months. So that is massive. You got this. And, and uh, and a lot of that happens when when you bring in the right people, right? So it's it's in this sequence: people, process, and then products. Yeah. People, you need to have the right people. Hire smart people. Get out of their way. Uh, make sure they believe in the mission. Make sure they align with your values. I think that is one of the key things. And then, how are you reaching folks to help them you know, to help you scale? Like, what will be the customer segment, the next one that you're going after? Yeah, definitely. Right now, we serve technology companies and basically knowledge-based companies mm -hmm. that are more SMB or, or upper end of the SMB market. We are going into mid-market and large and right. uh, leveraging the same channels we've always done. Right? Yeah, that's going to be great for you. And, um, you know, when we talk about the founder journey, every day you've got to get up, you've got the kids, you've got a beloved in your life, right? Who's not an entrepreneur. They, you know, she needs attention. You have friends, you've got other things going on other than the business. There's still going to be those moments where you go, what was I thinking? I'm going to scale from 10 million to 40 million. You know, what, what happens when you have those moments of feeling inadequate and Anybody tuning in? This is not like, oh, I'm a founder now, so I'm. Good. I think I think everyone needs to get a business coach or a shrink. I don't have yeah. one, so so my business coach and shrink ends up being my best friend, who's my co-founder, and my wife, um, who's my other best friend. So that's it, yeah. right? Like you there's got two your or team. three people. Yeah, you got you got two or three people for you to offload. But I think eventually, as you grow and scale and scale more and more, everyone should get a business coach, and I should look into that in the next short near term i think i think it's really really important to talk to somebody and unload and help you navigate um because ultimately so that's one and the second thing is managing working out and taking care of your health i used to be very healthy in the last few months i haven't um if you if you take care of yourself your business will take care of itself like putting because if you're healthy and you have a strong body it leads to a strong mind like it's a good way to kill stress i think i think those two things are key take care of yourself personally focus on health work out um get it out of the way every day first thing in the morning 
and then get a business coach so your you know your yeah, folks, family family's not collateral damage to your <laughs> frustrations that's right you know no one really knows what you're going through even though your co your co-founder is going to know more than anybody um which is great but they don't need the burden of you going i don't know you know going for a business coach is one of the best investments that you can make folks because they're looking at this as with a non-biased view of you and your business. And they really want you to feel great about what you're doing and how do you shift your mind set. And that's what a coach can do for you. Um, and one more quick question from Asia, which is quick question. How do you measure performance metrics? Definitely. And I think that's the most important thing. Performance metrics all depend uh, based on the phase, right? So if you're a phase one company trying to validate the market and you have no product out there, it's like how many people have agreed and maybe paid, uh, done a paid pilot to to validate the idea when you're in the phase of product market fit. Um, again, there's leading indicators and lagging indicators for each department, right? Or, or this concept of objective and key result. If your objective is to get to a million dollars in revenue by the end of the year, then the key result would be maybe every month you get you know, X, X clients at Y revenue per client. And then the second thing is you have like a 100% customer retention rate. And then the third thing probably is you need to get to X connects. Like if you're cold calling is your channel, I need to get to X conversations a week. So you got to have the leading indicators and lagging indicators and then measure it. As you scale as a company, as a founder for me, employee happiness is number one. If you teach your people with love, and help them grow, they will treat your business with love and help your business grow. Ultimately, it's a people's game. You can build the biggest software in the world. You can you can be Elon Musk, but if if you treat your people with love and help them grow, they will help your business with love. They'll treat your business with love and your business will grow. So right now for us, top of mind is employee happiness. And one of, as one of the key OKRs in the company, employee happiness, and then the business goals as well, right? There's leading indicators and lagging indicators. But when you have great leaders in the company, when you're at a situation like me, we have a CTO who, who's come from building, you know, she was a CTO at a company that, I mean, she was in she was running engineering at a company that went public or our CMO has been a part of four acquisitions, one IPO. And he got all these leaders. Yeah. They have the metrics. Your job then at the top is to make sure people are happy and they understand the mission, the vision, the values, and you're embedding some level That's of right. camp camper in there. Yes, you do. And, and folks, if you really want to go deeper into what Lloyd was talking about, which is really your LTV CAC ratio, how to calculate them, how to check out those metrics, I have a really fun video. Hop on to my YouTube channel. Go get some Andy Licious advice on how to calculate this rec this ratio because you're looking at your LTV, your long term value of each client, your customer acquisition costs. How is it going? How are you going to keep them sticky coming back? Retention, all of that, and it can be like, Ugh, you don't have to calculate this. As Lloyd just said, that's something you're going to delegate, but you got to know why you want this. And so my video is a lot of fun. It's really helpful, Lloyd. Final question. How has entrepreneurship served you both personally and professionally? You have an incredible lived experience that you have brought to this journey. How is it now serving you? Definitely. Um, I think there's nothing that prepares you better for anything in life than entrepreneurship because you are faced with uncertainties on a daily basis and you got to navigate them and you got to overcome them. And as a result of navigating that and, and, and look at the uncertainties, right? It's not one ambiguity or uncertainty. You got the business uncertainty. You got to hire people. You got to evangelize in the media. You got to ship product and make sure customers are happy. Now manage investors on top of that. Take care of your family. All of that is a, is a great learning and growing experience. And no school or MBA or plan can prepare you for it. And it's a constant journey where you're learning and getting better and better and better. And it's not something that you can master. You event, you just keep growing with it. And then eventually you're gone. Yeah. yeah. Deeper awareness of who you be in the world. Oh, you have given us so much wonderful, wonderful advice today. I'm so grateful you carved out time to spend with the Startup Life live community. I know folks are going to benefit from your words of wisdom 
for years to come. Thank you. I so have much. one more thing to share, and I ask Please. a lot of people this. Um, you know, I, I said this theme here: life and business is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Relationships transcend companies, and your passion transcends companies to two things, right? So if you're unhappy somewhere, you may be passionate about the skill and you'll do it somewhere else. But and and your relationships, your friendships transcend companies. Ultimately, it's not the money in your bank that matters is the people around your tombstone that matter. And so it's really, really important to treat people with love and treat people with passion, treat it like a relationship on the way in. Uh, and, and it ties to this question I often ask people, if you could pick power, money, or impact, what would you pick? And sometimes people say power. I feel if you if you pick power, you you hunger for control, and you can never build something big because you're always paranoid about, about being in the know and control. If you pick money, it's great. You'll make good decisions, but sometimes it's shorter term decisions. And if you pick impact, ultimately you, you have the shot at building something really, really massive. You win. And, and you build a, build a movement, right? People who pick power and, and are power hungry, I feel they die alone. People who pick money all the time, there'll be people around their bed solely because they want your money. And if you pick impact you'll never sleep alone you'll never die alone that's okay. that's that's what i want to leave you with i am i am just filled with the joy of having you here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And also just thank you for being in the world in such an impactful way. You know, while you're building your family, building your relationships, building your community and building Boast AI, you are also building folks everywhere you glow with your wisdom and your willingness to share that. So I have a deep, deep thank you for that. Thank you so much. Oh, Andy. thank you. <laughs> thank you so great much. Pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. I'm going to pop you into the green room there. Hey, everyone. Oh, my gosh. My heart is just filled with joy because not only did Lloyd go into the deep details of machine learning, AI, starting off manually and building into uh, repeat and making systems smoother and procedures smoother and, and the customer outcomes, so many important, real smarty pants gems for the business. He really shared his life experience, what led him to this point, which I just love that story, coupled with the wisdom, the Andy Licious moments, the stitch that on a pillow that we had with him. It's just such a gift. Um, let me tell you who's coming on next on the Startup Life live show. We have a phenomenal female founder joining us on Tuesday, August 10th at 12 p.m. And it's Madeline Frazier. She's a serial entrepreneur and big thinker who loves creating consumer facing technology that solves a problem. And over the past five years, she has created and grown multiple startups, raising millions in funding for ideas she believes will make the world a better place. But now one day she was trying to design her own ring and she got so frustrated. She said, I'm going to start my own <laughs> design your own ring business called Gemist. And it's a custom jewelry brand that gives you the power to design your own jewelry, offering a 100% customizable experience. I got to tell you, we are going to learn a lot from this female founder. And remember, this is how you get alerts. <laughs> Whenever I post a new show, join the Startup Life Live meetup group bit.ly backslash startup life live live is in all caps scan the qr code get in there so you receive an alert whenever i go live now my parting words of wisdom for you right here and it's please 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 that you'll remember you're braver than you believe and you're stronger than you seem Oh, yeah. And as we say here in Boston, you're wicked smarter than you think, right? So keep going. This journey, as Lloyd said, will serve you and will have an impact both on you professionally, personally, as well as the world. Because when you bring your more fully expressed self to the world, we benefit from you, from your happiness, from your being on purpose. So until next time, I'm wishing you a delicious day and heartfelt thanks for tuning into the Startup Life Live show. Mwah! See you next time.